So, hello everyone, and it's really nice to be here. Um, huge thanks for the organizers of the event for the invitation, and thanks for everyone joining us via the live stream today. Um, so my talk today will focus on my collaborative PhD study with the Center for the Study of the Networked Image uh, at London South Bank University and Rhizome. In the summary of my talk, which Osman just read, um, I had to submit that summary many months ago now, before the pandemic started. And well, I still thought, you know, we'll be able to travel and visit the museum in person. Um, so at that long time ago, I outlined a couple of points in that summary, and I hope I will cover most of them today. Um, and I hope the talk will be of interest to everyone joining the live stream, but it will not be a very traditional preservation talk. You will see what I mean, hopefully, pretty soon as I start. So, um, I just wanted to start quickly with uh, an overview of Rhizome and my main object of study at Rhizome, the art base. I assume many of you are familiar with the organization, but bear with me uh, while I just introduce the organization over a few bullet points for everyone joining us who may not know who Rhizome are. So Rhizome started out as a community-based mailing list and an online platform in 1996 um, in New York, founded by artist Mark Tripe. Since 2002, they have been based on premises in the new museum uh, in New York, although, of course, uh, with the ongoing pandemic situation, everything's been moved remotely and we all work remotely at the moment. Um, Rhizome maintain an active artistic program, promoting born digital art projects, organizing exhibitions, special events with artists, curators, academics, etc. And since 1999, they maintain one of the largest online archives of born digital art, the art base. Um, the archive has over 2,000 artworks, and it started out as a grassroots initiative, um, originally with an open submission that everyone could submit works to the art base. And since 2013, um, open submission has been closed. And over the last few years specifically, the, archi the archive has essentially been uh, in a sort of put into a sleep mode while we do essential maintenance. So what underpins uh, the research project with Rhizome is, of course, uh, Rhizome's digital preservation program. However, I won't really talk about this today, as my supervisor at Rhizome, Dragon Espenshit, actually already did a talk at this very series of events last year. Uh, and in case you haven't seen it, that talk is online on the digital SSM website, so you should really check it out. What I will talk about today is how some of the outcomes of this program impact the art base, and um, I will focus specifically on the design of the interface of the archive and the data that contextualizes the artworks and how all of that relates to matters of digital preservation as well. So at the beginning of my research in 2016, the art base had already been overhauled several times, both in terms of the backend infrastructure as well as front end design. I developed this timeline in order to trace the history of the archive and start to better understand what events led to um, different instantiation of the archive itself and more specifically to the latest iteration, which um, I came to, uh, to learn more about when I joined Rhizome. So in 2016, the landing page of the archive was integrated into Rhizome's main website. It offered a few curated exhibitions and a single inch point to the artworks a grid of thumbnail images representing every artwork in the archive. Once a user clicked on an artwork thumbnail, they accessed a landing page for the artwork record. But those pages hardly looked like a typical archive database entry. There was a single image representing the work, a short text description with uh, most often not specified provenance, and only the name of usually a single artist, and a single date. To experience the actual works, users could click on a button which would take the user to a new location uh, in a new tab, sometimes linking to a work held uh, in Rhizome's archival repository, sometimes linking to a location on the artist's own server, and on frequent occasion, rendering a 404 page, or in other words, a missing link. Even when the link was not broken, the artwork that the user would gain access to might be in a very different state compared to the time the work was added to the archive. Parts of the work may be broken, missing, or dependent on browser plugins no longer supported in contemporary browsers. 
All of these scenarios led, lead to perplexing and frustrating user experiences in the archive. And maybe just to not be so opaque, the particular example I'm showing here is basically uh, giving us this error message, meaning that it, it is refusing to connect to a particular online service that the artwork needs. In this case, uh, uh, I think edition.cnn.com, which was an old version uh, of the CNN website service. And so this artwork, even though we have a copy of it in our um, archival repository, we're not actually able to render any kind of user experience because it is missing all of these kind of essential external services that it depends on. But um, so with no, no contextualization on the archival interface uh, to indicate to users how these works came to be, even the works that were actually well preserved by the active interventions of the digital preservation team at Rhizome were subject to the same limitations um, and sort of limited interact interaction patterns within the art based interface design framework. This framework was not able to answer questions such as who was involved in the artwork production, maybe more collaborators than a single artist, how the work evolves over time. Did the artists made intentional ch uh, changes? Did the work change because of updates in the technical protocols of the web and the browsers used to access the web? Or did the art-based team change the work in order to preserve it? Rhizome's team were of course aware that the limitations of traditional approaches to digital archival interfaces impacted the value of the art base um, and net art, net art archives in general as a service to the net art community. And Rhizome were, of course, keen to explore alternatives, and this is sort of how my own research project came about. So reimagining the art-based interface in a way that could better support and make clearly visible to users all the efforts that went into preserving the works requires, required more than a redesign around surface level branding and styling. It necessitated considering how a digital archival system for born digital materials works and for whom? In what ways should an archive management system address the links between a front end interface used by the public and the various tools and infrastructures deployed by the in house staff to store and preserve the artwork data as well as the artwork's contextual metadata? So, this kind of very <laughs> A uh, fuzzy uh, animation that you're seeing in the background of this slide is actually a graph diagram I was able to pull via the query service that we're currently using uh, in the new art-based database. And it, you know, it's not essential that you can't really see any details in this thing. It's just sort of trying to show a little subset of the data that we're working with and how even with just a little subset of the data, we can already show a wealth of relations that exist among metadata entries when we sort of um, give up on thinking about the art-based interfaces, this kind of very traditional single object oriented um, kind of interface. And this is more like a zoomed in version into that graph di diagram that I was showing on the previous slide. So instead of thinking of the art-based interface as some kind of top layer in a conventional technical stack consisting of software and hardware, in the research project uh, with Rhizome, I approached the art base as a network of relations between users, which includes um, institutional staff, artists, programmers, different kinds of collaborators, academics, the audience, and the digital infrastructure. So it's relations between all of these groups of users and digital infrastructure. Unpacking these relations sets up the core issues of uh, my research project and what I seek to address with my research. So many, uh, many of these uh, issues are closely associated with the question of what constitutes a net art piece. And I know throughout the series of events organized by Digital SSM, you've all probably heard quite a lot about you know, what net art is or isn't, um, but I'm just going to do a kind of very brief recap uh, in this slide. So as Dragon Espinshid already discussed in his talk last year, um, net art works are not single self-contained objects. To be performed and experienced, net art depends upon alignments between hardware and software environments, network protocols, as well as user interactions. It can evolve over time into various instantiations, either because of intentional actions by the creators of the work or because of intervention by institutional staff at the archive 
working to preserve and or exhibit the works or because of structural changes in the software or network components of the works um, network assemblage. So Rhizome referred to all of these uh, different types of instantiations that may emerge throughout the life cycle of the artwork uh, as a variant or variants. So here is an illustration of just a sample of possible variants of an artwork in the art base, all stored in different locations and presented in different environments. This particular artwork is uh, called Untitled Scobars by Dutch artist Jan Robert Lechte. All of NetArt's particular properties around performativity, processuality, and potential existence across multiple instantiations, or as we call them variants, adds complexity to the efforts of any institution to collect, preserve, and in the end, to make such works readily accessible to the public via an online interface. And it is kind of like last bit around making these works accessible to the public via an online interface is where I position my own um, research contributions. So I will go back to the Scrollbars, Scrollbars artwork a little bit later in the talk, but first I want to mention another relevant example. And this may be very familiar to a lot of you. Uh, I also edit a little screenshot of this in my uh, uh, one of the earlier slides where I was talking about Dragon's contribution to this uh, series of events. This artwork is um, also the last artwork in the NetArt anthology exhibition that Rhizome staged um, in the last couple of years. So it is, I think, fair to say that it's one of the most recognizable artworks in the archive and also in NetArt canon as, uh, in general. It's a diagram illustrating the core component of all NetArt, the network. The image of simple NetArt diagram, that's the title of the artwork, um, and it's an artwork by collective MTA released under a CC uh, license, so Creative Commons license. So this image has been reproduced countlessly across the web and in print, most recently inspiring the title of the physical exhibition that uh, accompanied the NetArt Anthology exhibition that rise on stage online. And this physical exhibition uh, first opened in the new museum and it was titled The Art Happens Here. Simple net art diagram is not only a famous net art piece, but also an example of the types of complex temporalities and entangled relationships between work, var work variants commonly encountered in the art base. As the artist explained in a blog post in 2015, detailing the history of the work, the dating of the work was never straightforward. After an initial release as part of another artwork in 1998 called Time, the standalone GIF file was released in the year 2000, but the canonical version has a date included in the GIF image itself, circa 1997, as you can see here in the top right corner of the slide. According to the artist, they found a source file on their machines with creation date uh, metadata that said 1997. So they decided to revise the creation date of the work as well. Uh, and the artist themselves, he warned, uh, in a post to Rhizome's mailing list in 19, back in 1999, that confusion in multiple truths should be a part of NetArt's official strategy. This is not some sort of a, you know, accidental coincidence. It's it's all intentional. The art base has records for several MTA artworks, simple NetArt, di NetArt diagram and time being among them. The simple NetArt diagram date in the art base is given as 1997, while time is dated as 2002. Time was, date, was added to the archive actually as a cloned copy. In other words, a copy stored on Rhizome's own server repository. And that cloned copy was submitted in 2002, which accounts for that difference in dates, which we see across the, the different uh, records in the art base. And, you know, when compared to the artist's own website. In this example, the line between the creation date of a source file and the date accepted as part of the art history canon is blurry, intentionally so. What is more, in the history of the artwork narrated in 2015, uh, the artists in a blog post online, the artists also list a number of other artworks, some created by other artists too, which are variations based on the canonical diagram. And if I go back to the previous slide, in the bottom left corner, you see one of those other vari uh, variants created by another artist, a completely different time. Um, 
So being able to connect all of these different variants and timelines in the Artbase database through a flexible metadata framework would reveal more than just an interesting historical narrative. It can also help represent at least some of the processual, performative and networked characteristics that make the artwork a net art piece rather than just an object whose material characteristics we can fully capture in just a few basic descriptive metadata fields. So to this end, my research, in my research, I propose a new framework for modeling data in the art base, which carefully considers the temporal dim dimensions of net artworks involving development, deterioration, and or various acts of preservation performed by different agents, human and or machinic over time. It aims to account for changes in a work's technical or user interaction makeup due to an active intervention by the artist or due to a contextual event outside the control of the artist, such as a component becoming obsolete. Additionally, if a preservation action, such as the addition of a web archive or emulated instance of, of the artwork had been carried out, this can also be included alongside information about the agent who carried out the preservation action. This framework is also able to describe a variety of possible connections emerging among metadata entries in each record, such as the dependence on a specific plugin um, and the correlating emulation configuration, which may be necessary for preservation, for instance. The overarching conceptual principle connecting these different modalities of the framework is not any particular metadata standard, but rather the principle of archival provenance. And before I move on to explain a little bit more about that, I just want to say that what I'm showing in this slide is just a particular, a small part of the overall data model. Um, this chart actually shows um, where provenance data is aligned to a variant record and where provenance related data also aligns to a variant record. The full data model, I'll explain later where you can find that, but this is just one particular section of it. Um, so to get back to the concept of provenance, I propose to use the term provenance uh, used widely in archival science, as well as, of course, many other fields of curatorial studies, museum studies, art history, etc. cetera. Um, and I propose to use this term in a very specific sense. So I want to use it as the summative expression of a data model framework that can represent the complex context around artwork records in the art base. The term is appropriate, I think, if an expanded notion of provenance is taken into consideration as advocated by postmodern archival science scholars, uh, such as Brian Brothman, Terry Cook, Chris Hurley, among many others, um, starting since early 90s. The archival record in postmodern archival science is no longer understood to be a static value neutral entity, but rather a dynamic process of creation, production and interpretation which is carried out by multiple agents, including the authors, archivists, and the larger cultural context of, me of memory institutions. Given the theoretical developments around the conception of the archival record as a process, rather than just a thing, consisting of dynamic relationships, archival scholars have, rec have recognized the need to expand the definitions or even redefine core archival concepts, such as context, provenance, and authorship, particularly in relation to born digital artifacts um, in digital archives. In the case of the NetArt archive, provenance description and authorship in the archive need to be considered not only because the artifacts in the archive are digital and network, networked, but also because of the context of a community specific culture around uh, digital spaces emerging with the mainstream spread of accessible network connections since the late 80s and developing further into the 90s and the beginning of the 21st century. This culture is quite different from traditional Western archival and curatorial understanding of the artist as a sole creator of a unique object. Multiple contributions with different uh, contributors with different roles and levels of contribution ranging from artists and programmers to audience members, as well as multiple variations of the artworks involving all or some of the above actors complicate the more traditional readings around authorship and provenance. So I'm suggesting that this kind of condition uh, re uh, results in a plurality of agencies that we need to be able to account for in, in the data models that we're working with um, in an archival infrastructure context and also uh, on the level of the interface. 
So the focus of the provenance driven data model moves away from a description of siloed objects towards establishing patterns or recipes for describing the relationships between concepts, entities, and agents. Looking to other community or domain specific metadata standards that may be familiar um, or already in use by art based users has also been helpful in selecting the terms as well as patterns of relating data in the new art based model. So we didn't just, um, of course, develop the provenance framework in isolation. We looked at a range of different standards. And the slide here is not comprehensive, it's just showing like a very small amount of these. Um, however, after looking at a range of standards, what we realized was that the established metadata schemas or ontologies for archival or museum institutions focus, tend, tend to focus overwhelmingly on the description of physical objects and are not really readily applicable to the net art case study. Many of these standards are designed to operate in siloed environments and still conform to narrower, more limiting conceptions of provenance, authorship, and context around records. Examples of limited utility, which have already been considered in previous instantiations of the art base infrastructure, include standards such as Dublin Core or CDWA, uh, which stands for, as I have on the slide, categories for description of works of art. Even more expansive standards, such as CDOC CRM, focus on predominantly uh, focus predominantly on physical objects and the events that bind them in their physical environments. In contrast to traditional cultural heritage standards, models from the field of digital preservation and web standards have been focusing on the description of processes and relationships already for some time, uh, actually. So premise is an example of this kind of standard. It's an event-based standard for describing digital preservation metadata, which is widely used in the digital preservation community. However, the level of abstraction in premise is of a degree that at Rhizome we have not found particularly useful. Well, um, we feel that it's more useful to managers of digital asset repositories, for example, who need to perform actions such as monitoring checksums or file format validation, uh, than to the curators and conservators of Rhizome who are concerned with artistic and historic integrity of the artworks, not just the technical integrity. So again, we felt like that particular standard didn't really fully meet our needs. And in contrast, we looked at uh, a different standard from a different field, PROV, a model developed by the Provenance Working Group at W3C or the World Wide Web Consortium, specifically to express the provenance of digital data on the web. It provides an efficient approach to representing data at a variety of scales, from a single graphic file to entire websites. With the limited ontology of properties and entity categories, but highly abstracted patterns of relating concepts and entities, PROV provides a flexibility needed for modeling heterogeneous, non-standardized digital artifacts, like net artworks, in fact. At its most abstract, the PROV model can be described as a network of relations between entities, agents, and activities following a few formal patterns, such as, as illustrated in this diagram here, derivation, generation, and association. What do I mean by this? So relationships of derivation uh, can help express the links between multiple variants of the works in the archive. Um, it, ex it expresses relationships uh, such as one variant deriving from another or one variant being an alternate instance of another variant. Relationships of generation then can add additional technical specificity to the processes of creation, like how do these derivations um, or alternate versions came about. And finally, the relationships of association or attribution can provide the accountability of agents and their influence on the archive, which has been emphasized in postmodern archival theory. In a research case study project carried out in collaboration with art historian and researcher, Dr. Dr. Karin Develt, whom I believe may be on the live stream today. So hi, Karin, if you're watching. Um, so in our collaboration uh, between 2018 and 2019, we um, argued and proposed that PROV is applicable to the case study of net artworks, since other provenance standards, since unlike other provenance standards, which tend to focus on a single entity like the art object and its history of ownership, PROV describes, and I quote here, the people, institutions, entities, and activities involved in producing, influencing, or delivering a piece, a piece of data or a thing, end quote. 
In a paper published in the IPRESS 2019 proceedings, IPRESS is a digital preservation uh, annual conference. So you know, in our paper there last year, we argued that several key characteristics of the PROV model make it particularly well suited to the needs of NetArc. And I'm just going to read this quote because it, I think it sort of outlines these characteristics pretty well. So the PROV model not only captures the creation of the artwork, but also how various actors contribute to or influence the work over time. For instance, for instance, these may include individuals or institutions who commission, acquire, transfer, or modify the work. Furthermore, PROV-DM, that stands for PROV data model, can capture the different variations of a single artwork, even when these are preserved across various institutions. A single internet artwork can be included in multiple museum collections, web archives, whilst at the same time remaining a part of the live web. So in our, in our case study and in our paper uh, for IPRESS, we tested the application of the probe model to a specific artwork from the yeah. artbase. And remember when I told you I'm gonna come back to the scroll bars artwork? Yeah, so this is it. We used untitled scroll bars for uh, our case study. Uh, and so in the test application, we traced the authorship of the artwork and all of the variants that we had available in the art base. And uh, we sort of traced how they derive uh, from each other, from different variations, and also we um, we trace the authorship of these different variants and uh, the kinds of um, forms of generation activities and also attributions and associations to different agents in the network. And I'm not going to go into great detail explaining this diagram because uh, our paper is available online on the IPRESS website and it's a very short paper, so you can delve into the details if you're interested. Um, Okay, so PROV is a great model, but that still it's a conceptual model, right? How do we implement it? So PROV can be implemented in a linked data knowledge management system. This is actually possible with the art base because Rhizome have been using Wikibase, which is a linked data database, as our collection management system since 2015. Wikibase is the open source software environment built to run Wikidata. Wikidata is a knowledge base of public domain linked data maintained by the nonprofit Wikimedia Foundation. In the case of the ArtBase, Wikibase is developed, is deployed as a standalone instance independent from Wikidata. While it still follows RDF, which stands for Resource Description Framework Data Modeling Conventions, which allow the data to be published as part of the semantic web, a Wikibase instance requires custom configuration of concepts and properties. So this allows us to be more independent than a kind of global knowledge management system like Wikidata, which is quite general and encompasses multiple knowledge domains and it, in, in the end is not that useful to us. We can use Wikibase and still be part of the semantic web, but configure exactly the concepts and properties we want. So this is how Rhizome, Rhizome's Wikibase can adopt some of the particular properties and um, terms from the ontology of prof and the and data model relationships. So the loose couplings of entities, agents, and activities provides the basic building blocks of a framework for the custom art-based data model, which can describe provenance data, such as relationships of derivation or association, as well as a range of other administrative, descriptive, and technical metadata related to artwork, variants, agents, or software entities in the archive. This additional data can also be expressed with statements using the provontology where suitable but there's no strict requirement to do so. The new data model for the art base builds upon the provenance framework by implementing the majority of properties and concepts provided by the provontology, but it also includes a range of custom properties, which extends the technical domain of the framework towards the specifics of preservation actions conducted at Rhizome. And this slide here just demonstrates how we implemented PROF um, partially for the untitled scroll bars case study, but uh, of course, this is just a small subset of statements that you see on the screen here. We, uh, we actually have a more expansive uh, set of statements available in the Artbase that can extend into this technical context. So if I go back to this kind of bigger diagram that I was showing earlier around the kinds of uh, properties and data we can associate with the variant, uh, I want in this slide, I'm focusing specifically on this right-hand side, which is the more um, expansive provenance related data, right? 
So these include recording the technical or media source resource dependencies of the networks, as well as the environment and or interaction patterns required for the, for the re-performance of the artworks. And you can see here once again, um, yeah, how all of this can be specifically related to a variant, right? So it's not, uh, we're not attaching um, these kind of individual properties to an artwork in general, but we are being very specific about each variant um, in the in the archive and how and how we approach uh, uh, representation and reperformance of those. And uh, beyond regarding the relation between an artwork variant and a particular um, sorry, beyond recording the relation between an artwork variant and a particular plugin or environment, the framework can also record relations to particular generation or archival activities. Um, again, I'm sorry if these kind of tables are not very clear. It's it's very hard really trying to figure out how to how to represent a data model in a way that's uh, not horribly dry and boring. But um, so what I'm showing in this slide specifically is the kinds of generation activities uh, and archival plans we can have in the art base and then what kinds of properties we want to attach to them. So we want to be talking about different tools or resources that we use for a generation activity, which creates a particular variant. And we also want to talk about archival plants or the kinds of um, sort of recipes that the preservation team applies to a specific uh, archival preservation procedure. And the types of procedures I've listed here, just a small sample uh, drawn actually from the NetArt ontology exhibition um, procedures, which were outlined um, in the book accompanying the exhibition. And there's an online, a really great online resource, um, which I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with that right when we released. It's available from their website, so I'm sure you can find it. It's a Google spreadsheet that outlines these kinds of different uh, archival activities that happened um, throughout the exhibition. But now what we're doing with the art base is actually trying to make these kinds of activities into real data and like include that data into the art base rather than um, into the archival infrastructure rather than just having them published in a book, right? Or in a spreadsheet somewhere separately. Um, Lastly, well, this is like the end of the provenance data framework. So the last slide about it. Um, the, the provenance data, driven, the provenance driven fr data framework also allows the description of exhibitions and other events related to the artwork or a particular variant. Um, these may also play a role, as these may also play a role in the staging of specific reperformances and preservation actions by uh, archivists. And now I will probably spend the last 10 minutes or so I have um, uh, talking a little bit about the interface and how all of these kind of data models and, and approaches to metadata help us build different kinds uh, of interfaces to the archive. So to sum up, the main issues I've been trying to address with the work on the provenance driven data framework include NetArt's characteristic to change and evolve over time due to technical dependencies and performance requirements or due to intentional interventions by the artists and archivists, um, as well as the related implications for collecting and preserving such works. These implica implications extend to the lack of means to articulate and meaningfully express multiple variants of an artwork as both the artwork and as individually distinct entities at the same time within a standardized museum registrar information system. In order to address this, I developed um, design prototypes and, ran, and I ran uh, several user research meetings and workshops over the years of my research as, um, as part of my practice with Rhizome. The prototypes communicate a set of new visual strategies to uh, representing net art in the art base, reliant on this new underlying data structure that I've proposed as well. So today I'll only discuss two specific elements of the prototype interfaces. First, the uh, variant access points. The access points to individual variants developed via the New Arbex interface prototypes attempt to communicate two primary points. First, what variant is the user accessing and where? Is it under the care of the artist or the archive? Is it the web archive or an emulated instance of the work, etc.? And second, what is the condition of this variant? Is it completely inaccessible, partly damaged or generally functional? Following evaluation sessions with Rhizome in-house staff and external users, the prototype designs edit additional visual cues in the form of icons to differentiate between variants, as well as for the terminology explanations available upon hovering over or clicking on the buttons. I should stress that these prototypes do not aim to be polished, finished interface mockups, but rather working documents 
to be used by various agents in the research process as a means of communication and also as a means of iter iteratively refining the data model and information architecture of the archive. There will be further phase of refining the visual design to be more in line with Trizon's branding as well as uh, as part of the ongoing implementation of my research within Rhizome's infrastructure, which is happening over the coming months. In addition to the variant access points, timeline visualizations are another key visual design and interaction tactic in moving away from the conventions associated with object-based museum collection records towards a performance-focused uh, uh, presentation contextualized within a particular time frame. In the new art-based interface prototypes, timeline visualizations replace the static way of dating an artwork applied in the art base in the past and also applied in many other institu typical institutional uh, digital archives. Instead of the standard timelines deployed in these kind of more standard uh, institutional interfaces to provide an overview of uh, a, whole, a whole collection. So uh, basically, you know, timeline, a timeline is nothing new, like many other institutions use it, but they generally just use it to, to visualize a whole collection. Um, in the case of the art base, the timeline is applied granularly at the level of an individual artwork record. These visualizations acknowledge that a net artwork is not a fixed entity, but rather a time-based performative and processual assemblage of multiple components, which often operate in parallel. Based on currently available data in the art base, the timeline prototypes are prepared to map simple data points to begin with, um, like the date of inception of the artwork, or uh, inception, by inception I mean creation, um, or um, um, or, or kind of dates where uh, the artwork stopped being active anymore, or, as well as different um, exhibition or other events that happened. Um, notably, the term provenance actually is not really explicitly included anywhere within the timeline interface or the variant um, access points. Nevertheless, some users, particularly members of communities of archival practice, were able to pick up on the potential of these interface visualizations to serve as provenance research tools. As some users noted during workshop sessions with the prototypes, and I quote here, the timeline is, uh, in the prototype are great provenance tools. It, allow, it shows the conception of net art and the changes it's been um, through, end quote. And then I have another quote. Uh, Love the timeline visualization tool in my various archival work environments. This is one of the most basic yet confusing aspects of understanding a work, end quote. So the timeline visu visualization design tactic provides an at a glance temporal context for the various um, instantiations or variants of a work and respective provenance, um, which is something that basically many users, particularly academics and researchers have been requesting since uh, I started doing the user research process. Now I know I'm probably getting close to 40 minutes already. So there's a couple of slides I can skip and I can just go straight to conclusion or if it's okay, I can take another five minutes and just um, add a, f a few more details around the interfaces, but I wonder if the hosts can uh, can tell me if it's okay to to take an extra five minutes, or basically tell me if you want me to stop. I think I'll just keep going unless you tell me to stop. Um, so we have enough time. Okay, cool. Uh, I think it's just going to be an extra five minutes if that's okay. So the presentation so far has established the proposition that the art based archive is a network of relations. Mm -hmm. Ah, I can still see. It seems to me like I'm sharing my my um, slides only, but maybe I can stop the share and restart it. Yes, yes, Better? you can, you, you can. Yeah, yeah, yes, no problem. Okay, so you don't see any notes or anything distracting, right? But the desktop is the presentation. Uh, yeah, it's like a black, uh, a black uh, background of the slide and like three different screenshots on top of it. So I hope that is what you all see. That's the slide. Um, 
Yeah, <laughs> it's just a slightly unusual slide where I'm trying. I'm going to talk now a little bit about plural interfaces. So, yeah, I hope you can actually see what I'm what I want you all to see. <laughs> it's one of those Zoom mysteries. So I'm just going to keep talking, and then when I switch to switch to the next slide, probably it will become more obvious if something's amiss with the presentation or not. So the presentation so far has tried to establish the proposition that the art-based archive is a network of relations which span across archival data, metadata, users, hardware, software, networking components, and more. The implication of the network concept is that while it is possible to speak of an archival infrastructure tightly coupled with an archival interface in general, a more precise expression of the network would in fact observe multiple infrastructures and multiple interfaces. As Dragon Espenscheid has noted in past conversations, quote, the art base cannot be a single platform that embodies all the preservation techniques that Rhizome uses, but it can use the linked data database to connect across distinct technical approaches and preservation tools, end quote. Any connections that happen across the multiple infrastructures, all part of Rhizome's digital preservation program and part of the user experience of the art base, should also be expressed by appropriate visual tactics for navigating plural user interfaces. Working with Rhizome over the past few years, I became familiar with the web recorder, which is now um, technically retitled to Conifor, at least within Rhizome, um, as well as the emulation as a service tools, which helped the prototype, uh, which helped me prototype the relationships between the ArtBase interface and the presentation of artworks from the ArtBase via web archiving or emulation tools. While the ArtBase infrastructure would hold all the metadata for these artwork variants, including URL access points, um, and could present that to users via its visual interface, the actual execution of the artwork reperformance happens within the, new, the infrastructure of these separate tools. Two additional prototypes were developed to, pro to propose a partial integration of art-based data into the presentation uh, interfaces of these tools. The styling of these prototypes interfaces was distinct from the main art-based wireframes, but these interfaces too were uh, conceived just as templates, which could be styled as and when required based on overall branding strategies at Rhizome. Their primary goal was to connect the user's experience from the art base to that of the reperformance environment via the familiar ontology and conceptualization around temporal and performative context. Displaying details such as the original URL of the artwork, when it was archived and by whom, what archival actions were taken, if any, what particular dependencies informed the current presentation on view, all followed the provenance-driven framework of the new art-based data model and infrastructure. The role of the visual interface elements and the inclusion of contextual metadata here was, once more, uh, to act as a communication tool for users who might uh, access the artworks via different routes, for example, via a link shared on social media that leads straight to the reperformance, as opposed to going through Rhizome website, Rhizome archive uh, front page, then digging deeper into individual artworks. Um, but what would always happen uh, if uh, the users follow these pathways is that they would discover more relations across the network of connected infrastructures and interfaces that assemble the art base because of these additional elements provided by these interface prototypes. Uh, and I should probably say that all of these prototypes, they are available on um, GitHub. I think I put a link, yeah. So top right corner of this slide is the link. Uh, if you're interested in exploring in more detail later. So that's it, I'm concluding now. In conclusion, um, Preserving NetArt involves various conservation actions on the data or software needed to reperform the works and make them accessible to users. But it also involves preserving and presenting data around the works that can be that can document past conservation actions and inform future ones. The reperformance of the work is a collaboration between the artist, the archival organization, and the users accessing the works in their own browsers at home, facilitated via their archival interface. If this interface is to reflect and preserve the full complexity around these works, it needs new interaction patterns, such as access points to different artwork variants or timeline visualizations, among others. These are all made possible by a standards compatible, but also flexible and customizable provenance-driven linked data metadata framework. And that's it. <laughs>